Hello, wonderful listeners. Today on the English Mystic Podcast, we have a remarkable guest joining us. She's a former Nike executive turned multi seven figure property investor, and she's a certified money coach. She's on a mission to empower women in transforming their financial landscapes. With a wealth of experience and a commitment to authenticity, please welcome the inspiring Rachel Jane Gregory. So our guest today is Rachel, and uh, welcome Rachel. First of all, where, where are you in the world for our speakers? I am in the village of London. <laughs> oh, that's a big village. <laughs> big village, multiple villages. So yeah, UK, the capital of London. Cool. And a very nice sofa you've got there. I believe that you've got a, a furry friend as well. I do have a furry friend. He's just a little bit asleep, I think, just next to us. Hopefully, he'll What's his name? Somewhere. His name is Nate. Beautiful. Cool. So we might see him running around at some point. Or we might see him running around at some point. At the moment, he's all snuggled in his bed. Very cute. Good. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the noise down then. <laughs> he likes to be the but... centre of attention. He might come and make an appearance. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, so, Rachel, can you share with us your journey from that amazing Nike executive through to becoming who you are now, like this multi seven figure property investor and certified money coach? So, how did it happen? Well, it happened probably in an unusual way, in the sense it wasn't uh, probably the best of circumstances, but I've learned over the years that big changes come usually out of big concerns and challenges right so yeah. um if we step back to 2011 mm -hmm. i actually got quite ill right so um long story short i kind of had a cold thing that then kind of knocked me flat basically for three days and i was like oh that's not normal mm -hmm. um and i literally knocked me completely flat for three days and i was like, oh it's just a one-off and then it happened again and then again and then again so at a certain point, I went and saw a doctor and was like, do you know who I am? I'm so important. Like, I can't have three days off work every month. This is not sustainable. Um, and they started to do tests. They were like, oh, you're vitamin D deficient. I'm like, yes, yeah, so it's 99% of the UK population, especially with the rain we've had recently. Um, and then, yeah, they carried on doing different tests. And eventually, they decided to send me to a neurologist on Harley Street. Mm -hmm. And he decided to give me an MRI scan of my brain and my spine and nerve conduction studies. And I didn't realise this at the time because I was completely naive, but they were testing for MS. Uh. And I was 35. Fortunately, they came back and said, you don't have that, which was like, because like when they told me that's what they were testing for in the results, I was like, whoa, <laughs> pardon, yeah. excuse me, what? Um... But yeah, they then said I'd got chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. Um, but I was doing crazy things. Like I was finish, forgetting words in the middle of sentences. And I, at that point in my life, I didn't have a to-do list. I, everything was in my head. So like to forget, forget words in the middle of the sentences was like, I'm going crazy. Mm. I then would put a glass down on the side. I'd misjudge it. It would fly on the floor. I'd trip over things. Like my whole world was like, what is going on? I am losing the plot. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a pretty scary time. And I, and I say the fatigue was really there. Like I was really exhausted all the time. Um, so yeah, so that's what they concluded. So that for me was a really big wake up call of like, hang on a minute, like this world is not working for you right now. We've got to do something different. Um, but while I acknowledged that, I was still in the reality of like living in London, which is not the cheapest place in the world to live. Mm -hmm. um, and I needed an income. Mm -hmm. I, I was then and still am single. So it was like, well, if I don't pay the bills, who is? So that led to some pretty like soul searching of like, well, what happens now? Um, and then there'd been a restructure in 2009. So through, sort of three, no, almost three years earlier. And that was the first one that Nike had ever been through. So at that point it was a real shock. And that's what had brought me actually from the European office to the London office. Um, cause it was in preparation for the 2012 Olympics that were coming. Um, and as I say, that was, was, that was the first one it'd ever been it was just an unheard of thing in our company because it was such a successfully cash rich company. It was, you know, not normal. Um, and then I heard rumors there was going to be a second one. I was like a second one, 
Now, actually, they've just re- they've just actually um, let go of 1,500 people just in the last couple of weeks. Oh, wow. So these uncommon things became a cycle. So, as I say, it happened sort of three years after the first one. And then from what I've seen of it um, subsequently, it's been almost every three years ongoingly. So, yeah, what became what was a bit of a shock at the beginning became a bit of a pattern. Um but yeah, I heard rumours that there was going to be another one. I was like, maybe this is my opportunity. <laughs> and like a lot of people would have not seen it, I appreciate it as an opportunity. But for me, I was like, this is potentially an opportunity for me to exit left and have a little bit of cash to tide me through whatever that thing looks like. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of bided my time for a couple of months. Um, and basically, yeah, that, that announcement then came through. Um, so I was offered like three positions to go back to Holland and go back to the European office and like double my income that I'd left on. You know, it was all very, you know, great opportunities. But I just knew it wasn't it wasn't the right opportunity for me anymore. And it was time for me to take, you know, I remember walking out of that office on the last day was like, I value myself more than this. Yeah. So it was a real thing of like choosing me mm-hmm. over the brand, which was a great brand. Like, I, you know, it's an incredible company to work for. Um, and I don't regret that time I spent there. You know, I spent a decade pretty much working for them mm. all over the world. Um, but it was an opportunity that I knew was, it was the right time for me to go do something different. Yeah. So, yeah. So then I had the then decision of like, well, I still need to earn an income, right? I still <laughs> need to pay the bills. I live in a material world like this. <laughs> we still live in a world that needs finance, right? Um so yeah, so I then looked and I was like, well, the things that I've always like loved has been property. Yeah. Like from a young age, wherever I was in the world, um, my dad and I would go look at estate agent windows and like go, what if, right? Never any intention of buying anything, but we'd always like dream window shop. We still do it to this day. This is still a thing the family does is window shop through estate agent windows. Um, I think we have, should have a like a free membership <laughs> permanently to right move on a premium level um but it's yeah so that's what I was going to do and I kind of again I remember saying like people like what are you going to do I'm like I'm going to do something to do with property and I think they all thought I was absolutely insane of like how is she ever going to do that like she hasn't got any money (laughs) what does that look like but that's yes that's what that's what that was the beginning of the journey um but yeah when I'd when I was working there as well, like I'd obviously made the decision I was then leaving, but I'd got a little bit of like work until I left. And my boss had said to me, you know, if you need to um, go and see a recruiter or like find a new job, like just go. But what had happened actually a few days earlier than that is I'd had to go to a lawyer's on Regent Street to remove my non-compete clause from my contract. <laughs> so I'd gone to them and signed the paperwork to remove that. And I got onto the tube at um, Oxford Circus to come home, so Victoria Line. And as I looked down, there was an evening standard, like, laying on the ground, as there typically is in the tube. And I picked it up, and it opened up to, like, how to make money from property, like a seminar. And I was like, <laughs> well, that was weird. Oh, wow. so it's, again, it was very much this sort of fateful thing of, like, I'd made the decision to do something, and then the opportunities were being presented to me. And it was happening in a hotel just around the corner from where I worked. And the reason I knew that that hotel was there was because since being ill, I'd had to change the way I got to work. Mm-hmm. Because I couldn't take the usual journey because I was exhausted by the time I got to work. So I started to take a bus route and different things to get to work. So I then ended up walking past this hotel on a daily basis. So I knew exactly where this hotel was. Again, another synchronicity that, you know, you wouldn't normally expect. So, yeah, so I turned up at there. And told my boss I was going to see a recruiter, um, went to a two-hour seminar. Um, that led to another training, which led to another training. But, yeah, I guess the rest is history. I then, you know, learned how to invest in property. Beautiful. It's, it's amazing isn't it, how many people have those golden handcuffs that there's there's so much money there, but your soul sort of says, yeah, that's great. However, yeah. you, you seek something different. It sounds yeah. like the universe was sort of going... She she's got that thought. Let's give her a hand and you know, the paper. Yeah. And as you past say, so many hotel. people keeping those handcuffs as well, right? I see people like biding their time and like living very unfulfilled lives because they need the cash. Yeah. Right. And you know they're not they're not necessarily choosing themselves. They they are 
as you say, golden handcuffs to stay in that those positions. Yeah, and there's many, many people there, and that's really the that's why it's good to share your story to say that yes, you can do. It's it's extremely scary, I'm sure, making that jump. However, sometimes you have to you have to do that, don't you? It's, it's the unknown. Um, yeah, yeah. and if I control. also <laughs> kind of I was a very different person then to where I am now. So like, if you saw me today, you'd be like, oh yeah, well it was easy for her. She can make those sort of decisions. You know, she's an empowered woman. Da, da, da. But at that point, I was a broken woman. Like, let, yeah. as I say, let's backtrack to 2011, 2012, right? My health was in a really chronic, you know, mm. really bad place. You know, it was a chronic condition. And my mindset at that point then had also gone down the toilet. So I was in a very kind of, I hate to use dark place, but I kind of was. Like, if anybody said anything slightly positive to me, <laughs> I would give a negative answer to it. Never a negative response, right? I couldn't see the light and the positive in anything. Mm -hmm. So, but it got to a point where I was like, I've got, it literally was, I've got to make a change. And if I don't make the change, nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. Like I still had some inner strength and fire in my belly of knowing that much, that I was 100% responsible for my life. And therefore, if it wasn't working right now, I needed to do something about it. And so I took that responsibility of like, well, this is my opportunity. And, you know, you've got to try, right? You've, at this point, you've got to try something else because what you're doing now isn't working. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. So, you, so you've gone on this beautiful journey and, you, and you've found how to do property investment. So at, at what point did you think, hmm, maybe I could help others do this? There must have been a time where you thought, actually, I, I've got it. How did you come to that and why? Why do you want to do that? So it started because the company that I learned from actually approached me and said, like, you're doing well. Can you do you want to come back and like help us? Yeah. Um, and that was something that actually I'd been really empowered about, even on my own training. I'd seen other people doing that and was like, oh, my God, that's what I'd like to do. So like even again, backtracking to when I was like five years old, I wanted to be a primary school teacher. Like mm -hmm. I never followed that route, but there was always something inside of me of wanting to give back contribute like contribution you know is one of my values um you know i'm a trustee of a local charity so like you know the, for me that opportunity to pay it forward was massive for me so you know it's something you know that not everybody has access to right it certainly wasn't something that i've got brought up with right i didn't know how to invest none of my family invested it's just not a skill that was taught at school it's not something i learned from parents so, you know, for many people, it's not accessible. Um, and I think beyond that, it's seen as not accessible. Like, it's not for me, right? Especially as a woman, it's like investing, that's a men's game, right? Surely it's not, you know, it's not possible for me. Yeah. So to enable to, you know, empower and inspire through what I've done to show people that actually if I could do it in the situation where I was, where I had no job, no income, a you know, little bit of money, but that was literally, you know, paying for me to live. It, well, I didn't use any of that to invest. Mm -hmm. And chronic health condition. No partner, no other support. If I can do it, then freaking anybody can do it. Yeah. And that's the inspiring thing about it is that people need to realise that, you know, you, you can be like down in the dumps and still with that inner fire, keep that inner fire going and, and follow it, follow the passion almost. No. Yeah, it became kind of a no, like I just knew I couldn't go back to corporate. Yeah, I get it. And it was almost that, you know, people talk about burning bridges. I'm, you know, I'm sure you've heard that analogy many times. Mm. I didn't necessarily see it like that, but just, I just knew for me that wasn't an option for me. I knew my body couldn't sustain that any longer. <laughs> and so I needed to find a new path. So it became like a, you know, a mission of like this, you know, it's got to work, I guess, right? And that 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 inner desire of like, this is what I want to create, and this is the life that I choose to, you know, to live. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's that point you're all in on. You is that burning the bridges, burning the boats, and because you're a hundred percent committed to it, you you don't. When you find problems, you you find a way around them rather than just go on oh, giving up because you know yeah. there's no backup. <laughs> yeah, no. you know, it, it is kind of like you know it's life you know i've just been reading some of my jinkies but like you know my life is about trial and error right but my, my i've definitely had a lot of things like 
you know, rocks, obstacles, whatever you want to call them, like come up in my life. Mm. But, you know, it's very cliche to say, but it is about that journey, right? It's, you know, while I'm very proud of what I've created about my property portfolio, what I'm most proud about is actually who I've become in the last 12 years. Yeah. Like, I can't believe it's almost 12 years since I, you know, left that last day. But like, that's the thing that I'm most proud of, mm. of who I've been able to become by being and navigating those challenges and, you know, traversing the different things without throwing the towel in. Yeah. You, know, you learn to trust things. yourself, don't you? So, so fully, you know, that it doesn't matter what, what comes up for a moment, it might shock you, but you get to the point, well, I've survived this so far. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah, kind of you. I think that's something that I see sometimes of people of kind of our age range. Let's say self trust becomes something that actually people lose. Yeah, like when they're younger, they maybe are with that vigor and that like ambition and anything's possible kind of scenario. But I think you know some people do get jaded by life, right? And Mm. you know we're very obviously very much living in interesting times right now, right? And it's. It, I understand, like, I have compassion for those people, right? It's it, You can easily be swept up in all of that. Yeah. And lose yourself inside of, like, you still, you know, I always say every day is a school day, right? You know, you, they're, they're like, you know it's not over until the fat lady sings, right? <laughs> you, you know, it's never too late. That's true. I mean, I was reading something the other day where they were saying that um, how many people in their 60s to their 80s have created c- successful businesses and yeah. companies? And we well, all like, think, was it, you know, was it, was it, was it Colonel, um, from Fracutai's Chicken Guy? Colonel, oh, yeah, yeah, say, exactly. I can't remember yeah. his name now, but Colonel, you know what I mean, Colonel somebody. Um, yeah, was he like in his, I think he was in his 60s or something, right? When he created yeah. KFC. Yeah, and there's a list of, of so many because people because people do get that you, you sort of, I did it myself, you fall into the oh, I must get a nine to five job and I must work for 40 years. And then you, you start getting to the end of that 40 years and you start thinking, well, I mean, well, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to just retire. I want to do something different. And you, you find that you've made it in your career, but your soul's just just not being fed all the Absolutely. way through. Yeah. You know, and so. I think to be honest, when I look back on me, that's potentially why I got ill. Like, you know, we know when you look at the connection between my, you know, mind, body, spirit, yeah. you know, I, I was always somebody that like growth, freedom is my number one value, growth is my number two, love, mm-hmm. connection, kind of contribution, you know, all those are kind of mixed up. Yeah. And I wasn't growing. Yeah. Like my work was really important to me in the world. And I wasn't getting that, that opportunity to grow. Yeah. And I didn't look for growth outside of work. I kind of was looking for it in one place. You know, now I look for growth in everything. But at yeah. that point, I was really focused on my growth was going to come from my career. And it wasn't coming from there. And the more it didn't happen, it almost became a self-fulfilling prophecy of feeling worse about myself. So no wonder I wasn't going to get the growth. Mm. Um, but inside of that, you know, lack of, uh, yeah, direction, I guess, or, you know, feeling like I was having a purpose in wor- the world... You know, that's obviously a big one for a lot of people. Again, that instinctual crisis of like, what am I here for? Like, you yeah. know, I remember, so bring up, remember stories. Like, I remember looking in my bathroom mirror every morning going, there's got to be more to life than this. Yeah. Like, they were the questions that I was asking myself on a daily basis. And it's like, how many times are you going to ask that before you do something about it? You find out, well, what is there more to life than this? Yeah. Um, but those are going to big questions that some people are not comfortable enough to go in and ask. True. Because they maybe don't want the answer. Yeah. Sometimes it's sort of safer being held and looked after and you know where you're going, what the next step is. And and it's it's probably not for everyone to to you know go out and have freedom. Some people don't need it. Some people need safety. So yeah, it's not not for everyone. But I've realized that actually security is also very important to me. I'm freedom and security. Yeah. Like it's, it, for me, it is, it's <laughs> paradox. It's almost like my, my security gives me freedom as well, really. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's so it's, you know, it's definitely the tangibility of both. Right. Um, That's good. So you on the journey, you became a certified money coach. What, 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 what's a certified money coach? And then how, how does that help the people, these thousands of people that you're looking to sort of assist? So, I'll just give you a backstory of what, uh, where that actually came up. So I started, as I say, helping people invest in property. 
Yeah. Um, and I started to work helping at events and then I started online coaching. Um, and I was talking to people all over the world, which are Australia, mm. New Zealand in the morning and then Europe and the UK in the evening, um, which was amazing. I absolutely adored it. But I started to see that whoever I was speaking to, there were similar things coming up, right? We all have our similar, <laughs> humans are humans, and we all had our similar like things that were um, maybe limiting us or you know blocking our way. I don't like the word blocking, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And one of the things was around money. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me that whether somebody had money or had not got money, they still had a relationship with money issue Hmm. so somebody might have a lot were concerned about investing it because they didn't want to let it go or they had shame around having it or guilt around having money some that didn't have it then we're living in scarcity and lack and you know it's never going to come and i you know almost like trying to grab hold of more yeah so i've always been you know practically quite good with money you know, again, going back to my childhood, I would look after my brothers and my savings accounts, which was like the five pound we got for Christmas and birthday from our grandparents, right? It wasn't big quantities, but we, you know, I looked after that and saved it to the point where we were able to buy a car in our teens yeah. or late teens, right? So, you know, again, we managed what we had, if that made sense. Yeah. But I didn't really understand at that point the inner workings of money, yeah. that inner relationship with money. But I saw that that was what was reflecting on the external so that's when again I was like okay well then this is something that I want to you know grow in and understand so I yeah found a company in the US actually that trained me to be a certified money coach that so it's more that the process of that is more around your inner relationship with money so it's diving into you know patterning from parents looking at your money stories from your childhood you know the subconscious obviously we know has been hardwired by the age of seven or eight Mm-hmm. so it's a lot of those things and you know for me it always mind blows me of like I had a Venezuelan client once where the way he drank his red wine was the same way as he cho- used his money and when he changed the way he drank his red wine he also changed the way that he read his <laughs> drank his red wine right it always blows my mind those behaviors <laughs> can cross food drink money that's amazing, isn't it? I suppose things. it's all those like uh, my dad always used to say, oh, "Money doesn't grow trees," you know, and that, that gets stuck, doesn't it? And yeah. you know, and you have this these like glass ceilings, as we call them, that yeah. limit you on wh- where you think your income should be and how much you should charge people. Well, you see yeah. these beliefs, and then you realise they're not even your beliefs, right? Yeah. Um, and they're like, you know, some of the times it's not even what you hear; it's what you observe. So again, mm-hmm. as a young child, you're very much a sponge of your experience, right? Yeah. So again, I had a client who never saw their mum eat dinner with them. Yeah. So his assumption was there wasn't enough food for his mum to eat, right? She'd given it to the children and there was none for her. <laughs> it happened when we went into the story and went and actually asked her because she was still living. We went and asked her. She just chose to have dinner later on her own. <laughs> but his whole story had been there wasn't enough for his mum to eat. Mm. So again, it's not, you know, we know we're meaning making machines, right? So sometimes it's not only what you're hearing or, you know, it's also what you're seeing and then the meaning you're putting behind all of that. So that's what was really fueling me of um, bringing that also into property because I see how those money patterns still show up. Even though you know how to invest, if you still got those money stories of like my classic one is when people, you know, you're building a property portfolio for as much as possible passive income. But you have a belief that, you know, you have to work hard to make money mm-hmm. and the portfolio doesn't really perform. It becomes hard work. Yeah. So it's fascinating. It's powerful, isn't it? The, what, what the mind thinks and what the mind believes is, is, becomes true for you because yeah. you almost sort of sabotage self-limit and everything, don't you? Yeah. And kind of your body also holds trauma and stuff, right, as well. Your body, you know, there's a book, isn't it? The body keeps your score that, yeah. you know, you, it also has some memories cellular memory mm. so it's again it's looking at it from all all perspectives so yeah so when i you know do my money coaching now we, we, we bring it into my property investing so it is looking at the inner work and the outer work it's you know the inner work definitely is the reflection of what shows up in the external um but yeah i what i love about that is because a lot of people will look at you know the emotional side or the spiritual side or they'll look at the practical you know finance stuff i love the weave of the both you yeah. know for me 
I feel my kind of soul mission is about you know com looking at the you know combination of the in you know the spiritual and the material world and seeing the two together because in many respects I feel some people you know shun the material world for the spiritual world you know you yeah. see that in healing communities and stuff like that of like I can't charge for my skills like you know it's a mm -hmm. gift you know and like almost like shun the material world yeah. and then there's some people that live in very much in a material world and shun the spiritual world and for me it's not a one or other it is an and yeah and that's my biggest word is and yeah and and is the bridge between the two isn't it so yeah that makes yeah. sense we can have oh. both right <laughs> yeah well yeah that's the, the balance isn't it you want both and you, you have to be in one camp or the other but ensuring you are in both not and like it's, you say, it's just a flow one. between the two like you know people talk about balance i personally don't think there is such a thing i really have this harmony now of the flow you know there's things that i you know do more of in the practical and the masculine energy and there's things that are more in the feminine yeah. and the spiritual energy and it's yeah that. exactly yeah if you if you're completely in the middle you're neither one nor the other <laughs> it is it's definitely a dance yeah 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 that's a good way of describing isn't it so you you say your your mission on your website says uh, the mission is to help one thousand women create a seven figure net worth by twenty thirty one, which is only seven years away. So <laughs> are you on plan, and how are you going to achieve this amazing goal? Quantum leaps. <laughs> so for me, obviously, that you know my vehicle to wealth and to generational impact and change is through property investment. You know that mm -hmm. is obviously again I am very much. The embodiment of what I teach, right? I I teach what I know, and yeah. the the know the know is the knowing, not just the knowledge, right? It's the actual lived experience of it. So you know, again, that's something that I've really learned is my gifts is also sharing my you know my trials and errors and my you know lived experience of doing it. So for me, it's very much about you know teaching. Again, I teach both genders, but for me, it's like a lot. Again, a lot of women don't think that this is for them. Like I personally actually see the money is kind of a bit more masculine, but actually investing. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually more feminine energy, interestingly. That, you know, that excess, that overflow is kind mm -hmm. of, tends to feel more in that, as I say, that flow energy. Um, so, yeah, but it's, you know, there's studies out there that say that women are better investors, but it's still an area where a lot of people think it's not for them. Yeah. So for me, that's kind of my mission is to bring that education, that inspiration, that empowerment to women that it's possible for them to. Um and I also want to find a way, I haven't worked this out completely yet, I'm working with my accountant on how this would look, but finding a way where it can be like almost like a circular economy as well. So there can be micro loans maybe going to female mm. entrepreneurs or other, you know, even startups or other businesses. So it becomes like a more than just for you, you know, for us learning, it can be a, a wider impact on society too. Beautiful. I love it. Sounds good. And then one of the things you say about empowering individuals, is there something you could sort of share with us that is in your, uh, the way you work? Are there some sort of a couple of key nuggets you could share to say? Um, well, as I say, I do weave the money work in with my investment. Mm -hmm. I also weave like mastery of self as well. Yeah. So it's almost like mastery of self, mastery of money, and then mastery of investment. Mm -hmm. Because as I say, I think there are other people out there that teach the property stuff, but nobody's really looking at the money and the person doing right. it. Um, and for me, I think the thing I've learned so much is you can take any strategy, mm -hmm. but not everybody will be successful with that strategy. So yeah. for, you, it's, for me, it's who's the being doing the doing. Right. But yeah well, there's a lot of people like you know their constant question is like how how yeah. do i do this whereas for me it's like well it's always looking why you want to do this mm -hmm. like what is your reason for doing this like so you're very very clear on where you are now and where you want to go because mm -hmm. again if not you can just get stuck in a vicious circle of doing yeah like i see that personally i see that a lot of investors they don't know when to stop they don't know when enough is enough they're caught in this perpetual cycle um and then it, as i say it's looking at you and like oftentimes the thing that's holding you back is not that the strategy is not working it's something more with you that's having you you know not go all in as we've talked about earlier or yeah. you know you don't want to let the money go 
you know, because yeah. again, money is there to flow right in and out like a like a tide. Um, so that for me is the big one is the being. The other one that I would say is probably um, where I put more focus on is um, looking at the people. Because mm-hmm. a lot of prop- a lot of people see property as property. Yeah. And so I think it's a property business, it's a building business, and also it's a process, like steps by steps. I can give you all the step by steps, but for me, it's also about the people, whether that's relationships with the estate agents, the letting agents, your builder, your tradespeople, um, your tenants. Mm -hmm. We're all humans in this and kind of like, you know, I just, literally have just put the phone down recently from my um, uh, insurance broker because he's retiring on Wednesday. And I'm like, you, he's taken me through the whole thing from like my first property <laughs> all the way through. I'm like, we're just having this conversation. You've seen my whole journey, right? From me going, I've just bought my first one <laughs> <laughs> to the whole thing, right? And that's that relationship is sacred. Yeah. Right. It's so important. Like I look at one of my estate agents that I had right at the beginning again, like we're still friends now. Mm. You know, he's not in the estate agency anymore. You know, he lives in a different part of the world, but we're still friends because that relationship was built. Yeah, that's true. We're, 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 we're in society now. I'm seeing there's there's a huge gap between people because we're all hiding. I mean, here we are on Zoom, but there's so many people hiding behind Zoom. And it's not until you get in person that the true connection occurs, is yeah. it? I, yeah. uh, yes, although I also have, through obviously the pandemic, I guess, a lot of connections that are worldwide that mm. I have not met. Yeah. But actually those connections, are, I feel, are still as pure. And like some of the people that I felt that with and then did meet in real life, it was like we'd known each other for years, right? Because we had that connection yeah. So it it depends if it, it you know some people have surface level superficial and some people can get deeper even on a screen right. True. So, true. It's true. And then I think the other part of mastery is again you know we are here to also like prosper. So for me it's moving the focus away from the making money mm-hmm. to the keeping of money. Yeah. Because I see a lot of talk in the world of like make six figures seven figures all of that and it's not actually like again i've seen through many years of like whether you're in careers or different things you can make money but not everybody can keep it and Mm. then invest it like for me wealth doesn't come from storing money wealth comes from what you invest it in yeah and that's then what's possible to pass down generations and like that generational impact can come from passing assets down but it also comes with taking the education down again that sharing of knowledge through the generations now uh, we said earlier that in schools they don't teach you these things it's 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 quite scary isn't it really because you come i I was watching something the other day it was tony robbins he said all probably all of you out there have have bought one of these and he shows a phone he said i'm just going to talk about apple because i've got an apple and he said do you know that if you went all the way through each of those those versions of the phone that you had to buy and didn't buy, but put the money instead into stocks, shares, invested in Apple, he said, guess how much money you would have made today? £216 million pounds if you'd put the money into the stock rather than buying the physical good. And, and it, it just blows your mind that, yeah. hold on a second, and so many of us aren't, educated in that way so yeah certainly I you're suppose that's actually my other thing though as well is that, that the education piece for sure but i think the other thing i see a lot of is the talk of kind of sacrifice now mm-hmm. for later gratification like that delayed gratification pit yeah. um, and i'm very much about you know live your legacy now and leave your legacy later so it's the end mm-hmm. again it's like you know it's we're living it now we're like you know, a lot of people are focused on what they can leave their children behind as a legacy piece. But actually, again, talking about what we were just saying about how we learn so much from those around us, mm-hmm. we live that legacy. You know, if you think of your grandparents, I'm fairly sure you pop the things you remember about them is not maybe anything you were left materially. Like for me, I've been left a thousand pounds. That's all I've been left for my grandparents. But what I remember about them was the way they lived. Yeah. You know, the things that they taught me, you know, the experiences we sh- we shared together they're mm. the things that you remember 
They had, so for me, that's the legacy that they left. Yeah. So, but you know, that's where I feel like some of you, you're not living now. Like, you know, it's the purpose of life is to live well. <laughs> True. Right. So it's thriving now and then also taking care. So if you live, you know, above your means now, you're not going to live well later. <laughs> but if you're also <laughs> focusing purely on the future and not living here, then in the nicest possible way, what's the point? True. Yeah. And, and again, you say it's that balance, it's that and it's, it's the, the both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I love it. Uh, is there a particular inspiring story you could uh, share? Yeah, of someone you've helped and on their financial journey. Um, one of my ones recently was like just restructuring somebody's finance. Yeah. Because I realised that everybody was getting paid except for them. Right. And again, it was almost <laughs> like, well, am, am I allowed to take some for me? So, you know, people are like, I run a business and I'm like, the purpose of a business is also to provide you an income. But it's almost like they didn't feel that that was what it was for. It's like the business is a different entity. It's not for me. Yeah. And so sometimes it's like working with that with people of like they're allowed to take some money from their business. Right. So, yeah. you know, we were looking at it and like, you know, say everybody in their business was was making money from their business, but they weren't. And, you know, for me as a business owner, you've got kind of two elements. You've got a salary per se that would be what somebody who you would employ to do what you do would be earning. Yeah. And then for me, the profit element is kind of like your reward for the risk, mm -hmm. perceived risk of creating that entity to, you know, support other people through employment or, you know, bring teachings and learnings to other people. So I think that was a big one for me was, you know, working with them to, you know, we we cut one of their finance figures by 30k a year. Oh, wow. You know, so that's what, another two and a half thousand a month they mm -hmm. were making through just restructuring the way things were set up. Wow. So that's a yeah. practical piece, but it was also the inner work of like, you know, <laughs> able to receive, right? Yeah, you're not a charity, you, you can earn some money. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember one of my coaches saying to me, Pay yourself first, not last. No, yeah. It's just, just a simple thing. Oh, yeah. Hold on a second. I can do yeah. that. Yeah. Cool. So, the future. What does the future hold for you, Rachel, then? Both in property investing, coaching, and in life, even? <laughs> I'm having fun with my, my baby boy. He's looking very cute. He's opened his eyes. Oh, well, might get some barking. <laughs> So yeah, going on adventures with him in the forests, in the woods, in the countryside. So that's that's very important for me. Um, traveling. Oh, we like traveling to be, too. Like to a bit more travel. At the moment, probably with the dog, it will be UK based. We're going to Scotland in May. So nice. That'd be nice. Um, and then on the bigger field, kind of my my main focus at the moment is actually on like my consolidating my portfolio is where it is and just having it again performed the best it can mm -hmm. um it doesn't for me it doesn't always have to be in growth mode it can be in consolidation and profit mode too and have that you know work well and then my my big focus is on is on my coaching business at the moment because that's as i say that's the bit that really fuels me as well as like my my property business is at a point where it can support me fully yeah. so that gives me the time and the energy to then mm -hmm. put into helping others so that's mm -hmm. where the focus is right now that's beautiful. And so if somebody says, oh, Rachel is my woman, I need to, I need her. How do, how do they get hold of you? I say you don't need anybody, but I'm definitely there to guide <laughs> and support you. <laughs> um, I'm going to empower you to, to, be, to be not needing people. That again, for sometimes in coaching relationships, I see this codependency. Like mm -hmm. my work is very much about, you know, empowering you with the processes. So you can, you don't need to be dependent on me, right? You can create your own decisive decision making based on what, what's right for you because again what might be right for me might not be right for you so you're very clear on what your investment criteria is as well yeah. um so yeah for people want to you know reach out to me like social media is probably the best place to find me so rachel jane gregory or i am rachel jane gregory on instagram um is you know probably the best place to like you know dm me send me a message i'd love to have a chat with you if i can support you beautiful and is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience Ah, uh, what would I just do? Yeah, just didn't really enjoy life. I say life is to, life is for living well, um, and 
if you're in the place where I was in 2011, 2012, I think just know that there is a different reality, but you have to choose it. So be uncomfortable with the conversations and the questions that you may, you know, need to ask yourself and navigate. And, you know, you don't have to do this alone either. Right? You know, I didn't do it alone. I had support around me. Um, and that's why it's really important to me that, you know, I can inspire others to, you know, change their life too. And... Beautiful. Love the sentiment. And uh, I'm sure there'll be people knocking on your door looking for assistance. I'd love to help you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Kevin.